Assalamu alaikum everyone. So I think at the moment there's really only one topic that's been on all of our minds. The past few weeks have brought to the fore deeply held inequalities that exist globally. Systemic racism in the institutions that are designed to protect us, overall leading to the surfacing of emotions that have been simmering for much too long. Although the transatlantic slave trade was abolished in 1865, it would be completely flawed for us to assume that racism was abolished with it. We can see that in the US, the white man's prejudice against black people has morphed over the past hundred years or so. So in essence, what used to be an open, overt system of oppression, slavery, brutal lynching and slave codes, mutated slowly into the era of Jim Crow. This is where black and whites were segregated in schools, libraries, transports, and more. And black prisoners were rounded like cattle and won by the highest private bidder to perform labor for free. Prisoners doing big breaking work for no wage. Slavery remained slavery, but under a different name. Even after the civil rights movement, we have seen another change in this racial caste system. By the 1970s, those in power began calling for law and order due to a rising crime, which was actually caused by a baby boom, meaning there were more adults to commit crime. Politicians manipulated the situation. They linked the increase of crime to drug usage. This then triggered the war on drugs. So massive budgets were given to the prison and police forces to crack down on drug use. This was despite only 2% of the population believing that this was an important issue. Despite drug use being proven to be higher amongst white communities, such as the student population and the middle class, uh, rather than black communities, perversely the war on drugs concentrated on crack cocaine use, which targeted the poor black communities, leading to the mass incarceration of over a quarter of African-American men. The Human Rights Watch even reported that in 2000, African-Americans made up 80 to 90% of drug offenders, but this isn't because they are more likely to take drugs. Many of these people are in jail for long sentences. They're denied parole, they're on first time offenses. They were caught for small crack cocaine offenses and forced to make plea bargains, which are all legal changes to keep the black man in jail. And this all occurs whilst the drug cartels evade any conviction. So this is the new covert and haunting reality for black people in America. And George Floyd is the most recent case of police, police lynching. Countless African-Americans, as well as British black people, have lost their lives to the institutions who are meant to guarantee their safety. Amongst this endless list are the 32-year-olds Philandro Castile, 18-year-old Michael Brown, 17-year-old Trayvon Martin, and 40-year-old Sean Rigg. And so now the anger is palpable. The marches and demonstrations culminated in tearing down the statue of Ed Edward Colston in Bristol. So this is a man who had a prominent role in the Royal African Company, which is one of the largest slave trades at the time. British merchants were the second largest traffickers in the transatlantic slave trade. They transported over 3.4 million Africans to North America simply to meet the rising demands for sugar, cotton and tobacco back at home. The horrors of the British Empire, their prominent role in the slave trade, colonialism and imperialism are stains on our history and our curriculum must be inclusive of this. However, I feel as though some of the responses in the Muslim community during this time have been, well, Islam forbids racism, look at the Prophet, peace be upon him's farewell sermon, and the position of Bilal, may Allah be pleased with him. However, a little introspection suggests that firstly, our organisations and mosques are not always inclusive to our black brothers and sisters. Secondly, diversity at leadership levels is shockingly absent, whether this be women, black people, those with disabilities, amongst many other groups and people. We often fail to recognize the role the Muslim empire played in the slave trade, such as in the Abbasid period. Some Muslims also on social media are posting all lives matter. This just isn't the time. There's a time and a place for everything. And this only displaces the empathy from the black community at a time when we should be really vocally supportive. Here we could reflect on Surah Nisa, verse, one, verse 135, where it states, O you who believe, be persistently standing firm in justice, witnessing for Allah, even if it be against yourselves, parents or relatives. Finally, in, in conversation with many girls in my community, it's often said that the cultural beauty standard promotes the look of lighter skin. Just look at all the skin lightening products and Bollywood actresses. It's enough to cause a real complex. The pressure is real and the colorism does exist. So now is the time for working and educating ourselves 
aiding our, brother, uh, our brothers and sisters in our communities. In the Quran it states in Surah 49 verse 13, O mankind, indeed we have created you from male and female and made you people and tribes that you may know one another. Indeed, the most noble of you in the sight of Allah is the most righteous of you. So Allah does not judge us by the tone of our skin, our features or our gender. He judges us by what's in our hearts and the actions we perform. And so with this in mind, let us make this a time of heart and positive action. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Jazakallah khair for that. Let me just uh, share my screen to make sure it works. Right, um, here we go. I press play, right. Okay, is that working? Yes, all right. Um, okay, inshallah. Um, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasooli al-kareem wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een. Allahumma anfa'ni bima allamtani وَعَلَّمْنِي مَا يَنْفَعُنِي وَزِدْنِي عِلْمًا رَبِّ شْرَحْ لِي صُدْرِي وَيَسِّرْ لِي أَمْرِي وَحْلُ الْأُقْدَى مِنْ لِسَانِ يَفْقَرُ قَوْلِي So we are carrying on today with the story of uh, hadith uh, and Dr. Rizwan uh, started it off uh, last week and uh, this is just a presentation that I've adapted from uh, a couple of years ago so I'm going to skip through the first few uh, well, probably the first 30 slides, but some of it is a reminder uh, of uh, what we covered um, last time. And uh, so essentially the aim of, uh, the overall aim is to be religiously literate, to be uh, Islamically you know, literate in the sciences of, of this deen. Um, and, uh, you know, there's a, there's a funny story. I remember um, hearing it from uh, uh, Sheikh Hamza Yusuf in one of his videos of a, of a, uh, a theologian who was a gardener and he was in his um, garden and his neighbor came and they had a chat over the fence and uh, they were introducing themselves and the neighbor said, what do you do? And the theologian said, I, I'm, a, I'm a theologian. And the, and the neighbor said, well, I'm an atheist. And uh, so the theologian thought, okay, uh, have you read St. Augustine? The neighbor said, no. I said, oh, have you read St. Thomas Aquinas? And he said, no. And, and he thought, well, what about uh, you know, Meist, uh, uh, Meister Eckhart or uh, Julian of Norwich? And he said, no, I haven't read them either. He thought, well, maybe he's read uh, you know, the works of other you know, religious uh, philosophers. Have you read Avicenna, Averroes? Uh, you know, um, Al-Ghazali, Maimonides, and he said, no, I haven't read that, maybe he's read something more modern. So he said, have you read, you know, Maritain, Jacques Maritain, or William Lane Craig, or Peter Kreeft? And the neighbor said, no, I haven't read that either. And so at which point the theologian said, sir, you are, you're not an atheist, you are an ignoramus. Uh, that was a bit harsh, but essentially uh, the point is to be religiously literate. Uh, Sheikh Yasser Qadi said, look, if you're not, if you can't be a scholar, then at least don't be a jahil, <laughs> don't be ignorant. So this is the purpose of the, of the things that we're doing today. Um, starting off, obviously, I'm going to run through some of these slides, which you know already. Uh, the authority of the Sunnah uh, from the Quran. And we covered this last week, uh, that uh, the, the, the importance of the Sunnah. Uh, and uh, we covered this also from the Hadith. Uh, this is from, from the... Um, what the Imam Malik, uh, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi said, I have left you with two matters which, if you, which you will never lead you astray as long as you hold fast to them, the Book of Allah and the Sunnah of the Prophet. Um, now, one thing that we, we covered on a little bit uh, uh, last time was the difference of, between Sunnah and Hadith. Uh, sometimes there's some, there is some you know, confusion. Um, so this, I have stolen this uh, from... Uh, a recent presentation uh, from by uh, Dr. Maryam Shaybani. She did it on, in Ramadan uh, from the Cambridge Muslim College. And it's an amazing thing, completely free. If you go to the website, you will see this, this presentation, uh, these lectures, and they're very easy to understand. As she explained it re really very, very well. Hadith is, a, is like a single anecdote or like a data point, or a sunnah is the aggregate. 
you consider all the relevant evidence uh, for the sunna. And she had this lovely little uh, you know, graph, uh, which I thought was very well explained. Each of those circles you could see uh, represents like a hadith or different type of hadith, maybe a strong hadith, a weak hadith. Uh, and, uh, and the circle represents the sunnah, considers all the relevant evidence, maybe the gray ones are the, are the, the, the very weak hadith that lie outside of that, not considered. So uh, we also covered this a little bit last time. How can we know the sunnah? Well, the, the main body of, the body of hadith is the main source of the sunnah. Uh, what are the, uh, but there are other sources of the sunnah in particular the practice of the early Muslim communities, especially in Medina, certainly that's the case for the school of, of Imam Malik. Uh, and this, of course, you should know, what is a hadith, a uh, statement, action, consent uh, of the Prophet wasallam. And every hadith has two parts. It has a sanad and a matan. Uh, I think you know this as well. Uh, but also remember that every time there is a different, uh, different sanad, even if the text is the same, it has a different chain to the, uh, the same text or a similar text, it's considered another hadith. Um, for most of us, we would just say it's the same hadith because we often don't see the chain, we don't see the sanad uh, in the books that we read, we just see the text. But for a muhaddith, for a scholar of hadith, uh, it has it is a, a whole other hadith. So uh, the same text but a different chain is another hadith. Okay, so we need to remember that. Uh, we covered this a little bit last time as well. The main ways of preserving hadith, memorization, writing, and practice. And this was throughout the generations uh, from the Sahaba to the Tabi'i, the Tabi Tabi'i, uh, and onwards. People memorized the hadith, they wrote the hadith, and they practiced uh, what, was, what was taught. Um, preservation by memory. Uh, uh, um, this is a famous hadith uh, and preservation. There was a hadith, I think we mentioned this last time, there was an early prohibition of writing. Uh, we know about this because uh, this hadith is, uh, is collected by the muhaddith, the uh, muhaddithin. And uh, there are two views on this hadith about the prohibition. One is that the hadith were prohibited because uh, alongside the, the Quran in case they got mixed up. The other one was that they were abrogated later on. Uh, and the second one is, is, is slightly more, uh, more prominent um, because we know that the uh, companions did uh, record the hadith. Uh, uh, it's a famous one where the Prophet wasallam said to a person who said, I cannot retain what you say in my memory. He said, take the aid of your right hand. And another famous hadith uh, by Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As, who used to write down everything the Prophet said and uh, whether happy or sad. And uh, he said, yes, uh, nothing that comes out uh, is a lie. You know. um, and obviously, hadith was also required, you know, to uh, so govern uh, as well. So there were other. Uh, now, so the first phase, so I'm going to skip through some slides quickly, but, but just highlight one or two words from these slides. The first one, the first phase is of, of transmission and collection. Uh, it's remember, the first word to remember is uh, the uh, sahifas. Sahifas, these are the documents uh, which, were, which were compiled by the, uh, the uh, Sahaba and the successors after them. Um, uh, the Sahaba who compiled the documents of, of Hadith. Uh, um, I have a question. I was going to ask this question uh, about uh, who narrated the most Hadith. Older companions, younger companions, people that came after the companions. Um, but uh, I uh, un unable to work out the technology for this, unfortunately. So uh, um, I can't see the, the the chat. But anyway, the answer is uh, it is it's B, the um, younger companions. And and you find uh, Dr. Jonathan Brown said it's it's a little bit like uh, perhaps uh, you know uh, so called grandchildren eager to hear about 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 the, about uh, a. You know, grandfather. So you find that it's the junior companions who were the most prolific in collecting hadith, Abu Huraira, Abdul ibn Umar, and, and you should get to know these names and get to know these, uh, these people because uh, these, are the, these are the famous, uh, uh, some, some of the most famous companions who narrated the hadith. So um, uh, we mentioned the corroboration uh, between the companions um, amongst themselves where it was difficult to attribute something to the Prophet. Uh, without, without someone noticing this. 
also because they were very some of the older companions were busy with the with governing but also they were very careful uh, because of the famous hadith which is uh, which is uh, described as mutawatir uh, the prophet uh, said whoever intentionally fabricates something against me let him reserve his seat uh, in the fire uh, so we covered that last week as well and uh, other companions who narrate the hadith um, and uh, the sahifas at the time of the sahaba Okay, and uh, we mentioned also the Sahabas who traveled, went to different places. Um, you can see here uh, some examples. Um, and these were hadith transmitters amongst the Tabi'een. So these Sahifas have been, have been memorized. They've been taught to the next generation who have memorized them and have, have, have written them down and collected. So you can see the, some of the chains. So you can see some of the chains of the Isnad building uh, through these sahifas. Uh, so the, the sahih, some of the early isnads that appear in hadith collections are a record of the sahifas being, being handed down to them. Uh, but they're more like an aid, aid to uh, sort of memory, or the sahifas are also sort of personal collections. So we move on to the second phase. Uh, and I'm sorry if I'm going too, too quickly, but we're kind of covering ground that we covered uh, last week before I get on to the, the main focus, which is about Imam Bukhari. But the second phase, and remember this word is Musannas. So Musannas, so these are the, the formal, if you like, formal compilation of Hadith. And the other thing of this period is uh, fitna, uh, so, so civil war uh, within the Muslim uh, world, and the fabrication uh, of Hadith began uh, and at the same, and because of this also, the questioning of Isnad, the questioning of the Isnad before. Uh, so there are some important things to remember uh, within this period uh, of, of Musannafs, and the most famous of Musannaf from that period is the Muwatta of Imam Malik. Um, so we talked previously about uh, how fabrica fabrication began, what are the reasons for fabrication, uh, political reasons, uh, storytelling just to excite or frighten people, uh, or people were doing it for sort of personal gain. Um, and these are important things to remember as well. Uh, Imam Malik, uh, so Imam Ahmed ibn Salim, uh, who was a student of the last companion, of the last of the major companions to pass away, which was Anas bin Malik, radiallahu anh, he said, people would not ask about the isnad, but when the fitna happened, they would say, name to us your sources. And Imam Malik said, the first one to utilize the isnad was, uh, Al-Zuhri. Now he's an important person because uh, Khalif uh, Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, or the Khalif the second, uh, he was the first to commission the different governors uh, to, to write, to, uh, to, to compile these, these hadith. And he asked Abu Bakr ibn Hazm and Ibn Shahab al-Zuhri, it's not clear exactly who was the first literally to do it, but both of them uh, did it. And don't forget, or be, bear in mind that al-Zuhri and Ibn Hazm, they already had hadith collections, uh, but they just didn't make them public. They didn't, you know, publish them if you like. They were their own written collections, and they were using them to teach to teach people. But it wasn't available to the, 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 sort, of, the sort of masses. Uh, famous Muslims of this period, uh, Imam Malik is the most famous one. Uh, and Imam Shafi said about the Muwatta, he said there is not on the face of the earth a book after the Book of Allah which is more authentic than the Book of Malik. Now remember that. Imam Malik said, there is, there is not a book more authentic than the book of Imam Malik. Okay, uh, the third phase, uh, and this is just before we get to um, Imam Bukhari. Um, and the, the, the word to remember in this one is, is Musnad. Musnad. So we talked about the uh, increasing uh, uh, importance of the Isnad. Uh, and uh, the, the Musnads are, are collections based on the chain. They're arranged in order of companions. So they're not based on a kind of theme or sort of subject matter. They're arranged based on, on, uh, on, the, on, the, on the chains or which, which companion it, it came from. Uh, another feature of this period is increased travel. And I'll talk about the process of authentication. Uh, increased travel, al-rihla fi talab al uh, journey in the quest for knowledge, a feature of this period, uh, and we mentioned this uh, last time as well. Um, the most famous musnad is that of Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal. 
uh, so uh, he sifted through thousands of hadith and the Musnad is a huge, huge collection, about 27,000 uh, hadith, but about a third of these are original petitions. Um, we, we're gonna, I'm just gonna emphasize this again uh, from last time because it's a really, really important feature, uh, a unique feature really uh, of this deen. And uh, the, uh, Ibn al-Mubarak uh, said, the Isnad is part of the religion. If not for the Isnad, whoever wanted could say whatever they wanted. And uh, so this is a very, very important feature. Um, uh, and it's a feature because it's the first level of defense in the authentication of Hadith. So the, the Musnads or compilations of Hadith were only with an Isnad or the first level of defense. Anything that hasn't got Hadith, essentially, uh, it's uh, the, the, the quote here is, is uh, it's, it's vinegar and sprouts, not even interested. Of course, you can, uh, you know, you, somebody could, uh, you know, forge an isnad. So the second level, if you like, of, of defense is ch checking who is, who are the transmitters, who are the people in the in the hadith, and what are their, uh, what is their, uh, you know, the credibility. Credibility in in two ways: credibility in terms of trustworthiness and honesty but also credibility in terms of reliability and also accuracy. Uh, uh, you know, so someone could be honest and trustworthy, but and have, a very, have a very poor memory. Um, and the third level, the third kind of defense is uh, checking for reports from students, because you, had, you have now got a network of, uh, you know, of, um, of, of, of students and scholars and uh, um, uh, you can check if one one teacher has taught, has one student claims to have heard a hadith from the from the from his his teacher. You say, well, who else heard the same hadith? So you can cross check. Anyway, so uh, so we get to the point here where I'm about to introduce to you um, the famous uh, the, the famous Imam Bukhari. Some points to note about where we are at this point combination of memorization and hadith collections this is very important to remember that the hadith are not just written down they're not being memorized as well uh, between teachers and students increased travel for knowledge because we have you have uh, you know networks of people uh, of teachers and students uh, around the uh, the uh, muslim world reports of the isna we mentioned concurrent verification of hadith transmitters you see, so at every level, people were people were people knew who were the ones who were reliable and who were the who were the unreliable people. At every at every stage, uh, who were the who were the reliable and who were the, the unreliable people, and uh, as the 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 Musnads represent the vast hadith collections amongst the scholars, you know where they have. Uh, mixtures of hadith of uh, some ranging from weak to to uh, what would be called sahih or what is called sahih uh, it within uh, but at the same time in this period amongst the masses uh, you also have although the scholars have been have done their job in one way of uh, of having these collections these you know mustads and they know the they know who the reliable and unreliable people are there is also a crisis amongst the masses of, of, of the hadith being you know, fabricated and uh, weak hadith being used. And um, uh, people, people like to be entertained, uh, you know, to be fair. Uh, and some of, the, some of the fabricated hadith that you will laugh when you hear them because they're so, got some strange, you know, far-fetched stories and things. Uh, but uh, some of them invented by, you know, what's called charlatans. Um, but there was a need, a need to do something which had not been done before. Uh, and this was, this was a very important step uh, which uh, uh, had not been done before. Um, so, um, so we'll begin of uh, one of the uh, one of the greatest scholars that this ummah has uh, ever been um, you know blessed with imam bukhari uh, rahmatullahi uh, may allah have mercy uh, one of the 
you know, the thing about his intelligence, his knowledge, his memory, his ability, as well as his piety, honesty, and integrity, the more you read, the more impressed you will be, and uh, I won't be able to do justice uh, to, to his life. But, um, inshallah, we'll, we'll see what, how far we get. His name, Muhammad ibn Ismail ibn Ibrahim ibn al-Mughira al-Jufi al-Bukhari. Uh, so, al-Mughira, uh, his uh, great-grandfather, uh, he was the one that uh, converted to Islam at the time of the, of the time of the Sahaba. His name, uh, you can see, uh, Bukhari means he was from Bukhara in Uzbekistan, uh, on the famous uh, on the famous Silk Road. Uh, now, his father was a. Uh, before I mention that, um, it's interesting that uh, all the authors of the Sahih Sitta uh, were the, the famous, you know, canonical six six hadith collections. Uh, were from Central Asia or Iran, not, uh, they're not Arab. Very interesting uh, to, to note this. Now, his father was a, uh, himself a kind of, uh, you know, uh, a, a minor muhaddith. Uh, once was also a student of Imam Malik in Medina. And, uh, 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 but he died when uh, Imam Bukhari was very young. So he was raised by his, his mother. Uh, and uh, I did not know this, but uh, uh, there's another thing you can also see online um, by uh, Sheikh Akram Nadwi at the As Salam Institute. If you want to find out more about Imam Bukhari, uh, I suggest you go there, uh, switch channels, and go straight to these places uh, because there's so much more information uh, about, about him. But uh, all the, uh, the founders of the madhabs and Imam Bukhari were raised by their mothers, who were educated and pious women. And in fact, uh, uh, Imam Bukhari, uh, he lost his eyesight uh, as, a, as a child. And it was his mother that made, um, that made dua for him. Uh, one report, you know, for three years, consistently, uh, she, would, uh, she would make dua. And in fact, uh, she had, uh, it is said that she had a dream that uh, Prophet Ibrahim salam, told her that Allah restored uh, his sight due to her, her, her making dua and the next day he, his sight was restored. Anyway, his sight was restored. But what sight he had? He, uh, he had like an amazing, uh, I suppose you would call it a you know, photographic memory. Um, he was able to memorize and learn uh, amazing amounts of, uh, of, of hadith you know, later on, but his, uh, he obviously he learned Arabic at a young age, then he memorized the Quran, and then he began to study Hadith. And he memorized the works, uh, I think I mentioned a previous slide uh, of a previous generation of uh, famous scholars, Ibn al-Mubarak and, and Sufyan al-Thawri. So he had these works uh, in his possession in Bukhara, uh, some of these written collections of, of Hadith before he left his hometown. And there's a famous story where he, corrected his, his own teacher. Uh, and um, uh, when he was only 11 years old, and in those days, the teachers, uh, those, well, people used to teach without, uh, without having the notes, they, teach, they would teach from you know, memory, and the teacher was recalling a hadith, and of course, in those days, you, you recited the sanad and the, and the matan, the chain and the hadith, and uh, he was, uh, uh, Imam Bukhari was only 11 years old and he pointed out a mistake of the teacher in the chain. And, uh, um, and the teacher said, and he said, go and check, your, go and check your, your notes. The teacher checked his notes and he found he had indeed made a mistake. Very simple mistake. I think he, he, called, some, he called somebody Abu Zubair. And in fact, the name was, the, the name was Zubair ibn Adi. And he, he made a very, what you would think a minor mistake, but the, the science of hadith is a very, is a attention to detail is uh, is the the thing in this in this science. It's a very difficult science for many people, um, but uh, it is a very uh, it is a, a it is a ilm al kabir. It's a very big science, uh, and it, um, uh, you know it requires this, this kind of attention to detail, this kind of forensic, uh, if, if you like, analysis. And he was only 11 years old. And he said, and it said he memorized about 2,000 hadith even before he left his hometown. One report, 7,000 hadith. 
Um, and, you know, his memory was amazing. And there is a f another famous story uh, when later on, when he became famous, when he, he was traveling, he came back to Baghdad and uh, the, the famous Hadith test. Uh, and uh, you might have heard of it already. And uh, he came to Baghdad, he'd already established some kind of uh, you know, reputation. And um, the, um, the, um, the people of Baghdad, 10 scholars came to meet him and uh, they brought with them 10 hadith, but they mixed up the uh, chains uh, with, the, with the matan. They mixed up the, the text and had the wrong chain attached to the wrong hadith. So 10 people came, each one with 10 hadith, 100 hadith, uh, but with mixed up chains. And they presented it to Imam Bukhari. And each one, uh, Imam Bukhari would say, I don't recognize this hadith. Obviously, he knew the hadith in terms of the text, but he didn't know the, the chain because, uh, because it was the wrong chain. And uh, each one, he said, I don't know this hadith. I don't know this hadith. And uh, at the end of this, the end of this uh, pro 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 process, he not only, interestingly, he not only, he, he not only corrected them, in terms of what, uh, in terms of the correct chain attached to each hadith, but he had only heard them tell him once an incorrect chain. He repeated what they told him of the incorrect chain, and then told them exactly where they'd gone wrong. And later on, people had said that, you know, okay, they knew that Imam Bukhari probably would get, would know the correct chain, but he'd only heard the incorrect chain once, and still was able to, uh, you know repeat what, what, had been, what had been said. And uh, one of his teachers, uh, Ishaq ibn, ibn Rahawi, he used to know 70,000 hadith by memory. And Imam Bukhari, he knew 200,000 hadith by, by memory. And we, we, we are astounded by this today because we don't really use our memory <laughs> very much, but people use their memory a, a, lot, uh, a lot more perhaps in those days uh, than we do. Uh, extensive traveling. So we mentioned earlier that we've got to this period where there are, there is travel, uh, you know, all, uh, all over the place. Um, and we can see, I'll see on the next slide where, where Imam Bukhari used to travel. Um, he had over a thousand scholars, 1,080 I think is the number of uh, scholars that he had as teachers. Uh, and um, one of the things he did was every time he, he had a teacher, he would ask about them. He would ask about where they lived and what they, uh, who they studied with. And so he actually com compiled from a very young age, a, a, uh, a it's called the Tariq al-Kabir, the biography of Hadith transmitters. You know, it's a famous, it was a famous work even before his, his, his Sahih. And uh, this is part of Ilm al-Rajal, we mentioned uh, last time, the, the, the knowledge of, uh, of of the, of the hadith transmitters and, and the biography. It's an essential part of understanding the, uh, the quality of each, of each chain. He also wrote a book on the rulings of the Sahaba uh, at a young age as well. So actually Imam Bukhari was uh, very rare in the sense that uh, he was a master of hadith, but he was also a master of fiqh and a master of aqidah as well. And this, this kind of uh, you know, mastership is not, is not uh, common. Uh, in, in you know in, the, uh, in in history, most scholars will be specialising in one area, become a hadith rather than something else. Um, okay, uh, and uh, the other thing is, uh, okay, there's so many stories about his integrity and his piety uh, that uh, I will be able to cover. You know, um, with all of them. There is one story. Um, of a story, of, of, you probably have heard of it. Uh, Imam Bukhari was on a ship. Uh, he had some business and uh, he was um, uh, on a ship. He's carrying uh, a, a thousand dinars. Or, uh, I think it was a lot of money, a, a thousand dinars, equivalent to maybe 200,000 pounds, you know, in today's, it was some business he had to do, had to attend to. And uh, there was a, a kind of a con man on this ship who, who got to know him and got friendly with him and found out he was carrying this money. And uh, this, uh, this man tried to, uh, uh, he tried, he hatched a plan to try and get the money off uh, Imam Bukhari by uh, he, he calling out in the middle of the night, I've lost money, I've lost money. And uh, then the captain of the ship uh, orders that everyone on the ship is searched. Uh, and Imam Bukhari, 
instead of going through this process saying, no, it's my money, or, you know, whatever, you know, I had it before, whatever, he probably would have been found out. He threw the money overboard. He just threw it overboard. And so the money wasn't found. Later on, uh, this uh, con man was, Where did you, what did you do with the money? I know you had the money. What happened to it? And the Imam Bukhari said, uh, he said, uh, uh, I, I threw it away. And the man couldn't believe. Why did you throw it away? You can't use it. I can't use it. Nobody can use it. And Imam Bukhari said, I have spent a lifetime collecting hadith. And people have relied upon me and trusted me. So how can I subject myself to an accusation of theft? So he was protecting his reputation so that the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ would not be tarnished. And, he's, and that is worth far more than this thousand dinars. Uh, you can see here uh, his travels uh, from Bukhara to uh, Nishapur. Uh, the first one when he went uh, for, um, for Hajj, he went at the age of Hajj at 16. And when he went at the age of Hajj with his mother and his brother, uh, he uh, got to Mecca and uh, he requested permission to stay in Mecca and to learn. And that's like going to, going to university. Uh, there were so many scholars he was able to learn from, uh, from there. And from there he went to Medina, and that's when he wrote some of the early works, his tarikh and, uh, and the, the, the rulings of the Sahaba. And he, uh, he met many teachers along the way, uh, I said a thousand teachers. Um, uh, and uh, you, you can see here that some of the examples of teachers, and these people, this, these names, the most famous of them is Imam Ahmed bin Hanbal, but the other ones, they are, it's like a who's who of uh, the top, uh, you know, the top scholars of the time. Uh, and, and it's the first one actually, uh, Ishaq ibn, ibn Rahawi, uh, or pronounced Rahui as well in some, in some places, uh, who gave the idea of, of a collection uh, of, of, of the Sahih. Yeah, so um, we move on to his the, what, what he's most famous for, which is the Sahih al Bukhari, and the title of this is uh, is itself very very revealing. Uh, uh, so the full title, and this is the title from um, Ibn al Salah, uh, who is a Hadith scholar, and people will see different titles. The other one is the title uh, with the version by. Um, Ibn Hajar, but this one, Ibn Ibn Salah. So it's called Jami al Mustad al Sahih al Muhtasar min Fumur Rasulullah Sallallahu wa Ayami. So al Jami means it is a comprehensive collection of hadith, comprehensive range of subjects, of aqidah, legal rulings, and so many different aspects. And in fact, nobody had written previously a, a, a Jami until, until Sahih Bukhari. And it says al-Musnad. Al-Musnad means that all the hadith had their corresponding chains of narration included in, in the Sahih. It is as-Sahih, meaning that uh, it fulfilled all the conditions of authenticity. And uh, we'll see in a minute that uh, Imam Bukhari had very stringent conditions of authenticity, far more than any of the other, uh, any other, other people who collected. Uh, it says al-Mukhtasar, meaning it is a it's like it'd be like condensed it uh, condensed so it means that he didn't mention every single authentic hadith in this collection uh, so it's jammy in scope but it's muhtasar meaning uh, i don't plan to include every every sahih hadith in the whole world min amur rasulullah so from the uh, uh, if you like from the life and times of, of the prophet وسلم, it's not just the things he said but in biographical accounts what happened uh, you know, military episodes and things like this. The idea of the Sahih collection, so we mentioned before that there was this, uh, if you like, a kind of a, uh, um, uh, a crisis in some ways, but the Hadith collections were, were vast and it was, uh, it was Ibn Ishaq, his teacher, who mentioned uh, to him, uh, Ibn Ishaq Rahawa, he mentioned to his students that the need for the compilation containing only Sahih Hadith, because these were huge volumes and uh, there was difficulty for people other than Hadith scholars to actually benefit from, from books of Hadith. And uh, uh, Imam Bukhari actually had had a, he had a dream in which he was standing with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam 
and he was fanning away flies uh, from the Prophet. And, uh, he went to a person who asked him what it meant, and uh, the person replied that he would be, he would be one who repels lies away from the Prophet. Anyway, he heard this. He heard this uh, from uh, Ibn Ishaq. Ibn Ishaq, I understand, he died very young. So even though he had some great ideas and he was a genius himself, his teacher, uh, he wasn't able to carry it out. But Imam Bukhari was the he was the one. He said he would dedicate his life to to this. And so uh, it took sixteen years for him to uh, to write the Sahih Bukhari, sifting through six hundred thousand hadith, six hundred thousand hadith, uh, just selecting the ones which are of the highest authenticity. Uh, and he made ghusl and prayed to Rakat before adding any hadith. Um, and the conditions for authenticity were very strict. Uh, I think we'll cover this in a couple of weeks time when we do the, uh, the, the you know, the ulum uh, al-hadith or al al-hadith, uh, where we say what is, what is what constitutes sahih. But uh, for example, the first, the first one is that there should be a continuous chain, a continuous chain of narration. But it, um, it was not enough, uh, uh, and then each, each, each narrator in the chain is also checked for the credibility. But it was not enough for Imam Bukhari that, uh, for example, it was known that, uh, one, that one teacher had met this student, uh, or so one teacher had uh, you know, lived in the same place and time as a student, he wanted to know how and when exactly they met and what under what conditions uh, that they had met. He wanted to be sure of the way in which uh, the way in which one hadith was passed on to to another. And this is why uh, after Sahih Bukhari, uh, the consensus of the scholars is that it is the most authentic book after the Book of Allah. Uh, so um, this is. Uh, I remember we said this is what was said earlier about uh, the Uwatta of Imam Malik, uh, but uh, this is people said this now about about Sahih Bukhari. Um, has approximately seven and a half thousand hadith, but about two thousand seven hundred if you exclude exclude the um, repetitions. Has a very unique structure, uh, um, and I think really uh, to understand it fully, you have to know something about something about the, the science of hadith. The chapter headings demonstrate the fiqh of Bukhari, of Bukhari not just his, uh, no, I don't mean the legal rulings necessarily, but also his, un, his understanding. Uh, um, but uh, um, it, it's sometimes difficult to find hadith because he's got in, in different places. The very first hadith, actually I think I might have it in the next slide. The very, the very first hadith of Sahih Bukhari is the one that you all know probably in the Malamalu bin Niyat, deeds are, 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 are Upon intentions. This is the first, the first chapter, uh, the Kitab of Wahi, the beginning of Wahi. Uh, so you can see that uh, a lot of times the English, the English translations, they don't have the, they don't have the chain. But the Arabic, you can see, you can see the chain. And even though this hadith, you would ask, what's it got to do? What's it got to do with how revelation began? Because the next hadith is about how revelation began, how he received revel, how he received Wahi how the Prophet received Wahi, uh, but this hadith, uh, if you ask somebody, what, why is it the first hadith, and then you would give an answer about intention, and that's absolutely correct, about purifying intention before beginning, but also this hadith, um, according to Sheikh Akram Nadwi, there are about 700 versions of this hadith, uh, um, you know, around, and Imam Bukhari only picked seven, he only picked seven, and out of the seven, he chose this one to begin to begin in, in the Sahih Bukhari. And one of the reasons why he chose this one um, is because the, the people, the actual narrators of this hadith, they are from they are from Mecca uh, or Medina, and they are from Quraysh. <laughs> so uh, it's a very he's. I mean, it, you have to really understand hadith and, and, and narrators to understand the the, the genius behind uh, behind. Um, the, the structure of, of Sahih Bukhari, which confused many, many people, in actual fact. Um, uh, this, is, uh, this is a picture of the, uh, of the museum, I think, in Bukhara, um, uh, uh, where they, uh, the museum of Imam Bukhari in Uzbekistan. 
Uh, so that's why it is the most authentic book after the Book of Allah. Uh, now, um, he, he had, um, he taught, he spent 16 years compiling it and he spent the next 24 years teaching people the, the Sahih Bukhari. And uh, some of the people he taught were also famous Muhaddith later on. Uh, Imam Muslim was one of his students. And uh, uh, we will talk about Imam Muslim uh, now. So um, his, his collection of, uh, of, of, of Sahih uh, Hadith uh, is considered the second most authentic collection after Sahih Bukhari. And um, he was, because he was, you can see from the year, he's about 10, maybe 10, 15 years younger than Imam Bukhari. And he traveled, he was from Nishapur or Naysaburi uh, in Khurasan, part of Iran today. He traveled, like people had to travel to gain knowledge. Uh, unlike today, people just sit at home to get knowledge. <laughs> uh, you have to travel to gain knowledge. But he didn't travel as much as Imam Bukhari. And also because he was younger, he actually missed out, uh, I understand he missed out two generations of, uh, of, of, of um, scholars uh, who passed away by that, by that time. Uh, um, but uh, this is also a uh, very stringent level of, uh, of collection of hadith, uh, but perhaps not as stringent as, Sahib, as Imam Bukhari. So for example, as I said, mentioned earlier, one of the conditions was about the, uh, was the, the connection of, between teacher and student in the chain. Uh, Imam Muslim felt it was, it was very difficult, that was a very, very stringent condition. It was, condition. It was enough, it was enough that uh, a person had lived the same place and time as the, as the student. Um, and you only had to question how when it was people that were maybe not quite as uh, you know, reliable or accurate in, in, the, in the transmissions. But it's actually a, a slightly easier, uh, if you like, book uh, to, to read. Uh, it contains an introduction, uh, and, um, uh, which explains where Bukhari doesn't contain an introduction. And he has all the hadith, all the different chains of narration in, in one place. Uh, and uh, uh, so in some respects, uh, Sahih Muslim was, uh, was, was actually favored by uh, probably like a minority of, of, of people. Um, but when the two had, when the two and the hadith is found in, in both collections, then they are called they are called they are called they are, they are called agreed upon agreed upon mean agreed upon between Sahih Muslim and in, in Sahih Bukhari, and what in actual fact Sahih you can you could probably say Sahih is is like three levels of Sahih. There's the Sahih in Sahih Muslim and Sahih Bukhari. We've heard that they had very stringent conditions. And then another level is uh, in Abu Dawood and, and, and Tirmidhi. And then a third level is like this Ibn Hibban and, 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 and Hakim. So that's, uh, you know, you, that could be a way of, 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 uh, of you know, describing Sahih. So what was the reception? What was the reception to uh, what happened? So I initially, you know, in retrospect, you could look at what we had earlier. We had, we had the Sahifas. We had the Musannafs. And we had the Musnads. So we have these Sahifas, these personal documents. We had the Musannads, more formal compilations. Uh, then we had the Musnads, these huge uh, of compilations of Hadith based on Isnad. Um, and you could probably see retrospect from history that the Sahih and the Sunnan collections uh, were um, a, like a natural progression. Uh, but they were, for some people, they, they were, some Hadith scholars rejected this approach. Some of them felt that they was only being done for gain. Uh, others had disagreement with the judgments concerning the reliability of, of some of the people. And, uh, and, and for some other people, there was a kind of, a kind of finality uh, that disturbed some, some uh, you know, Hadith scholars. Um, um, but the, um, the response of Imam you know, Bukhari and Muslim was that, well, they did not include all Sahih Hadiths in circulation. Uh, um, he, uh, and Imam Muslim said he limited his books to Hadiths whose authenticity he believed was agreed upon, you know, by all. But as Imam Muslim explained, it is the duty of those who understand the science of Hadith to leave the common folk with trustworthy reports only. It was responding 
essentially to the needs of the time. And sometimes it's only years later that people can really appreciate the work uh, that, that has been done. And uh, Hadith collection continued after uh, Imam Bukhari and Muslim. And there was, the, there was the type of Hadith collection which uh, resulted in, the, in the, famous, uh, the famous collections. But there's a really interesting story of uh, you know, almost 100 years later, an Egyptian scholar, uh, uh, Ibn Asakan, I think, was asked uh, to, there were so many books of Hadith at this point, which ones should, should students focus on? And then he went, and some people approached him and asked him, uh, and uh, he went into his house, and he came back with four, he, he, he picked up or, you know, four collections. He said, Bukhari, Muslim, Abu Dawood, and al Nasai. These four, focus on these four. Um, and uh, so you see that uh, the four eventually became the five, the five became the six, uh, the, and the Sahiyang became uh, the common language for uh, you know, evaluating authenticity of hadith in these inter, inter madhab debates. But these hadith, they combine utility and, and um, authenticity. Um, so, um, criticism of hadith collections, um, we'll, maybe we'll talk about this, at a, I think we cover this in, in another future session, but it has become a bit of a sensitive topic in some ways, particularly criticism of Sahih Bukhari. Actually, the first one I think to critique was Imam, Imam Daraqutni, I think. Uh, some people think Sahih is, 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 Bukhari is like sacred. But it's an academic and professional work, probably the most academic and professional work uh, in the history uh, of Islamic scholarship uh, in some ways. It's made by a man, so by definition it is fallible. The problem with, with criticizing it is, is without really understanding it. So not looking at something critically is harmful, but looking at something critically without scholarship is also harmful. And I think that is the essential problem. But whoever has you know, looked at it crit in, in a critical eye with scholarship, they maybe only found 20 or so hadith with some problem in the Isnad or error in the Isnad, maybe you know, three or four with problems in the Matan, which is a very small percentage out of, you know, uh, out of 7,000. And, uh, and I finally must remember that uh, you know, books like Sahih Muslim and Sahih Bukhari were not written for the for the general public in a way, uh, or even uh, it was meant to read be read with proper training and you know understanding. And all of what we mentioned so far regarding authenticity is just the first step to understanding the hadith. The next step is interpreting the meaning of that hadith and its application in life. And remember, a single hadith is like a is like a is like a single anecdote or a data point. Whereas the sunnah is the aggregate. A scholar would consider all relevant hadith on a, on a particular subject. But the work of Imam Bukhari and Imam Muslim was an amazing achievement uh, for the, the Muslim Ummah. Um, rahmatullah alayhim. So uh, I hope this has been of, uh, of some benefit. And uh, I pray that we all increase our knowledge in these amazing uh, sciences of Islam and that we, we benefit from the knowledge that we have gained. And uh, any, any mistakes are mine. وآخر دعوانا والحمد لله رب العالمين سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك أشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت أستغفرك وأتوب إليك